Hello, Ray Phoenix here, and this is Wipeout Free Special Edition. We're going to be using Asagai to fly through the Classic League on Difficulty Phantom. The hardest difficulty in the game, this time is the Classic League. This is what really makes Wipeout Free Special Edition so special, so what it is. The fact that it also has eight tracks from the first two Wipeout games, the original Wipeout and Wipeout XL, which would be called Wipeout 2097 in the regions of this game was released. And I think Wipeout 2097 is a far more fitting title for the game. It's set in the year 2097, and it personally describes it as like XL. What's XL supposed to mean anyways? It doesn't really have much relevance to anything in the actual game itself, but 2097 actually does have a lot of relevance because it's set in the year 2097. And they could have called this game Wipeout 2110 because Wipeout 3 is supposedly set in the year 2110 for some time around them. They really did put a lot of attention to detail in these new in, in the in these tracks. They look just like they did in the original. This is Talon's Reach from Wipeout XL. And they really did put a lot of like you know effort into these tracks and a lot of like you know really does it really does capture what the original track looked like. It look, looks like they just took the exact same model of what they used for the game and they just re and they just put it into Wipeout Freeze Engine or Wipeout Freeze, whatever you know, Wipeout Freeze. They even left the ads all the same too. All the ads look exactly the same as they did in Wipeout XL. The only thing missing is Red Bull. There are no ads for Red Bull in this game because Red Bull clearly didn't sponsor any of the other Wipeout games. The Red Bull didn't sponsor this game, but also the Red Bull ads are absent. But other than that, all the other ads in, from Wipeout XL and the original Wipeout, they're all still present. They all look exactly the same as they did in the, in, in the original Wipeout and Wipeout XL. It's really cool that they did that. What's so great about this too is that the, the, one of the biggest flaws of the first two Wipeout games is that you could get, is that you can't do local two-player. You can't do local two-player, but it's not like put two controllers in. It only works with Link, like for linking two consoles together, two PlayStations together. You need two PlayStations and two TVs. But with Wipeout 3 and Wipeout 3 Special Edition, you can just do two-player just by plugging a second controller into the into the unit. So you could actually play real two-player with this. This is the best way to play. This is like playing the original Wipeouts, but with you know, two-player and actual... That's why that guy that tried to recreate that arcade machine from Hackers, that Wipeout arcade machine from the movie Hackers, that's why he actually used Wipeout Free for it, because Wipeout Free actually supports multiplayer with two controllers. So now we're going to another iconic race track. It's the first track from the original Wipeout, Ultima 7. This track is by far the most nostalgic Wipeout track for me. That's because I remember I remember first playing the original Wipeout in the first PlayStation Pix demo disc from 1995, and it had this exact track in the demo, the the Ultima 7s, that's why they, that's why I always think of the original Wipeout, it's very iconic, it really added a lot of detail, look, you can see the Aurora Borealis up there, it really added a lot of, like, nice, beautiful details right there, Aurora Borealis, it, it says it was somewhere in Canada, it's where this level's supposed to be taking place, it doesn't say where, though, I'm gonna imagine this is around maybe the northern part of the country, possibly BC or somewhere like that, where there's the northern lights and the northern... Yeah, this that probably does make sense. There's a Japanese flag or something that looks like a Japanese flag. That looks like a Moo Moo from Jumping Flash on that ad. All the ads from the original Wipeout are still here. One thing it did have to add to these original, these, tra these tracks from the original Wipeout, the original Wipeout didn't have any shielding or health or anything like that. So it was impossible to get eliminated in that game. And because of that, there weren't any of those things you could fly into that recharge your health or that would completely refill your health. Those were completely out since they had to add those into this game so it works, you know, so because so, of with Wipeout Free does have eliminations. And pretty much all the weapons from regular Wipeout Free are present in this Wipeout Free. Acid Guy is not one of my favorite ships in this game either. Oh, it's all the exact same ships. I don't think they added any ships or anything like that into this Wipeout Free special. It's all the same ones from regular Wipeout Free. Acid Guy is actually not one of my favorites. Acid Guy is really fast. And yeah, sure, he's really fast, but at the same time, he's also made out of paper mache. He even looks really frail and weak, too. He looks like something that was just stuck together with toothpicks. And then he has to use toothpicks to, as his wiring to, you know, barely stick him together, have to barely hold him in the place. He looks weak and fragile, which is exactly what he is. He's weak and fragile. He's easy to get destroyed. Just hit the wall a couple times, just smash into a couple walls, and he's dead. It's not as bad as Icarus, though. I think Icarus is probably a lot worse, because Icarus is like the worst of both worlds. Not only is Icarus pathetically slow, but Icarus is also very, you know, very um, destructible. You know, Icarus gets destroyed easily, very weak. And like I said, he's very slow, kind of like Warthog was in Twisted Metal Small Brawl. But Twisted Metal Small Brawl is the only Twisted Metal game where Warthog is pathetically weak. And some ships have different, like, like in Wipeout, for example. Like Wipeout, like I know Curex has the, has the, uh, 
has a reputation for being the more slower ship, but it's a stronger ship. And in this game, I think Curix is actually somewhat weak in this game, if I remember correctly. And some of the other ships are not, or a lot of them are not are very fast or not very weak. Gotaki was a personal favorite of mine in this game. I actually really liked Gotaki. He looks, he's made out of gold. Like, he's a ship that looks like, he looks like he's made out of pure gold. Looks like something gold member would fly. I remember my father used to yell at me for using Gotaki. He hated Gotaki for some reason. He would say you'd always use Fysar, so you'd always play as Fysar when you fly this, play this game. Which Fysar is the more evenly balanced ship in the game. And one of the things I don't like about Wipeout Pre Special Edition, a regular Wipeout Pre has the same flaw, is that if you were to, it's like to completely clear the game, or to get the game 100% complete, or what's considered 100% complete, you're going to have to play every single level in the game, on every single difficulty of every single ship. It really does eat up a lot of time. Sure. It does like give you, it does make people feel like they're getting their money's worth, and it is a lot of fun a lot of the time, but it can get boring easily. At least it's not as bad as Rage Racer. I've been playing Rage Racer a lot lately, that's pretty much the third Ridge Racer game. One of the worst things about that game is that, is that you pretty much have to play every level over and over again several times over and over again, and you earn credits, you earn money, and eventually you can use it to buy cars, but to get the really good cars in the game, you have to play all the, you have to play a bunch of the same levels over and over again. There isn't much variety in the levels, too. You're just doing the exact same thing over and over again. It gets dull and, and, and over time. Now you can see how people that play World of Warcraft must feel like, but again, people that play World of Warcraft must love the game because they spend more time playing that game than they do on anything else, which is why I never got into World of Warcraft. Like, they want you to go World of Warcraft with Rage Racer. So we're in another iconic track from Wipeout XL. Sag Marfa, I think it's called, or Sag Marta or something. I don't know what it's called exactly, but it's, it's supposed to be set somewhere in Nepal where it's all icy and snowy. Where it's all, like, where it's all icy and snowy, there's still advertisements everywhere. Because they even use the same kind of trees. As, so the trees are clearly sprites, which sprites in PS1 games were kind of dated by 2000. This, this, this special edition came out less than a year after the original Wipeout pre camp, This is something they would never do anymore these days. This is kind of like an original DLC, pretty much. Nowadays, they just release something like this as a DLC. But they didn't have DLCs back in 2000, mostly because it was on the original PlayStation, and it wasn't possible to connect the original PlayStation to the internet to, to download additional content for games. So this is really how you would do that. It's pretty much just the exact same game, but with these added levels and added features and everything. And now, from a perspective of playing on emulator, so obviously playing on emulator, because I could never get a real copy of this game because I don't live in Europe. There isn't really much of a point in playing regular Wipeout Free anymore. It's like, what's the point of playing regular Wipeout Free when you can play this? It's the exact same thing as regular Wipeout Free, but it has a lot more. It's all, it's all a lot more. It has way more content and way more stuff. So you might as well just play this. And the only reason why I would suggest still playing regular Wipeout Free is if you just want to dig out your old PS1, not using an emulator, but dig out your old PS1, which is what I'm probably going to be doing soon, and just play the nostalgic original classic Wipeout Free, playing on the actual system settled in North America. And that's the only version of Wipeout Free that came out in North America, is just the original regular Wipeout Free. So yeah, I guess it's still good for that. But, and I, and I might do like a further analysis too, you know, play the original, I haven't played the original Wipeout Free in a very long time, the regular vanilla Wipeout Free, I guess you could call it that, I haven't played that in a long time. So I'm probably going to be doing that again pretty soon, maybe I'll, maybe I could, you know, maybe I'll find some more differences or changes, stuff that I never noticed, or I don't know, I don't even remember last time I played regular Wipeout Free, I discovered this Wipeout Free Special Edition three years ago. And I've been hooked on it ever since. I don't really want to play a Wipeout game. This has pretty much been my go-to Wipeout game. This and the two PSP Wipeout games. Which I've actually been playing the two PSP Wipeout games a lot more lately. Wipeout Pure and Wipeout Pulse. Those ones are really good too. Wipeout Pure is like the, is like the prototype to Wipeout Pulse. Wipeout Pulse is like, it probably is the best Wipeout game since the PS1 era of Wipeout. Wipeout Pulse is awesome. I actually did get a release on PS2 in addition to PSP. The PS2 version was released exclusively in Europe. I guess it kind of makes sense, like how Twisted Metal had on the PS2 version was released exclusively in North America. Europe is to wipe out what North America is to Twisted Metal. They come from those regions of the world, so naturally they get a lot of games that only get released in those regions of the world. It's quite remarkable, actually. I mean, Twisted Metal games only came out in North America. Twisted Metal 3, 4... Small Brawl and the PS2 version of Head On were released exclusively in North America, while well, the rest did get releases in Europe and other parts of the world, but they were released in very limited amounts, limited quantities, and only Twisted Metal 1 and 2 are the only two Twisted Metal games that got released in Japan, and the Wipeout series is a similar thing. 
Getting Twisted Metal, the first two Twisted Metals got PC releases, and the first two Wipeout games. And then from what I've seen, the first two Wipeout games are the only PS1 Wipeout games that I know of that got released in Japan. I'm not, I, I actually did confirm recently that Wipeout 3, just Wipeout 3 in general, not obviously not Special Edition, but just regular Wipeout 3, it never got released in Japan, which I'm actually not surprised about that. I don't know about any of the other Wipeout games, like the post PS1 Wipeout games, I haven't really studied those ones as much. I don't really, I'm not really familiar with those. I mean, I did get really familiar with Wipeout Pure and Wipeout Pulse, but I don't really able to play those as much lately, but I will be making videos of those eventually. Wipeout Pulse is an awesome system, if that makes sense. It's not repetitive at all. It's actually very unique. It changes as you play through the game. It has so many modes of gameplay. It makes you kind of, like, cycle through all of them kind of thing. And you can win crap, and, and each ship, like, has, like, H, has, like, experience points, you know, XP experience points, kind of like an RPG, almost, where your characters can, like, level up. Well, you know, all the ships in Wipeout Pulse can do that. It's a really cool feature. I think, I think it's awesome they did that. That is, I think Rage Racer should have been. Rage Racer should have done something like that, where you get different cards, and you can, and you can level them up based on how many times you win. That's a ra- yeah, Wipeout Pulse is where Rage Racer should have been. And there's tournaments in the game, but the best part is you don't have to win every race in the tournament mode in order to win the overall tournament. If only the people that made the very original Wipeout game knew that. The original Wipeout game was very BS. I was never able to beat that game completely on actual PS1, simply because it's it's like, you know, it's not like it doesn't use logic of, oh, you won almost every race in the game except the last one. So you lose a tournament because you lost the last race. The original Wipeout's the only Wipeout game that does that. I remember my mom saying that she thinks the original Wipeout is the best one ever because it's nostalgic and has the best soundtrack in the series. And I told her, if you actually played Wipeout XL, you're going to think it's... And, and Wipeout 3. If you ever played Wipeout XL and Wipeout 3, you're going to say that those games are a lot better. They are a lot better. They are, by all, me- by all means, way better games than the very original Wipeout. But of course, if you don't play the games themselves, you're not necessarily going to know that. I kind of pointed out that scam about the original Twisted. Not that it's a scam, but we kind of well, it was a bit of a scam with the original Twisted Metal. You watch the trailer for it, and it shows the cars in battle and stuff like that. It actually shows actual footage of the game, so it's not lying. It's showing you what the game actually is. But the, but the thing that kind of dissuade, the kind of the misleading part, I guess you could say, of this is the fact that you don't actually know how bad the controls are. The original Twisted Metal is a very crusty game. A lot of controls that don't work very well, and the controls are very sloppy. But you wouldn't know that from just watching a video of the game. You have no idea the controls were sloppy. Well, well played on their part, I guess. At least it's more accurate than the Air Combat trailer. The Air Combat trailer was just, it didn't even have any actual scenes from the actual game. It just showed the plane, like CGI, like really high definition for what high definition was in 1995. CGI fighters going against each other, but never once actually shows any real footage from the game at all, so you would never even know. So you don't even know what the game's actually like. The game could be a com- that could be a complete total lie, which is something games did a lot of the time. I remember watching Stan Birdman again recently. I rediscovered Stan Birdman recently. He was playing this game on the Sega Genesis. I forget what it was called. But it has, like, really cool CG pre-rendered graphics. Kind of like that of Donkey Kong Country or Vector Man or something like that. Like, there's, it's, and they were, like, really good looking. Like, very well worthy of being on the PS1. But it was on the Sega Genesis, which made it even more impressive. But the game sucks. The controls are completely broken. You wouldn't have known that just from playing the game. Heck, people back then didn't even have video trailers to watch the game with. All they would have seen of the game was just a picture in a magazine that they would have said, Ooh, this looks awesome. I should get this. I don't even have any idea it's a fighting game from how it's described or from what's shown there. So people are, are probably those exact years that made all those decisions are sitting back thinking, Yep, we fooled them. We made up. We fought. We tricked them to thinking they're getting a really good game. But it turns out the game actually sucks. Well done. Well played. And now we just made a quick buck off them. Yeah, a quick buck off people are probably never going to buy that game again. Or the game's going to fail and never have any sequels. And again, the 90s was a pretty messed up decade of sequels. I like mentioned tons of times before about how it's auto dynamite heady, never got any sequels, but yet Bugsy got quite a lot of skills. People say that, oh, if a game doesn't get any sequels, that means it sucks, which isn't true. A lot of awesome games don't get sequels. Dynamite Heady never got any sequels. Quantum Redshift never got any sequels. I wish Quantum Redshift could have got more sequels. That was an awesome game. It's just like Wipeout, but it's on the original Xbox. That game is responsible for why I got an Xbox. I got an original Xbox thinking it had so many great, um, all the great, great exclusives, which it does. It does have a lot of good exclusive games on it, which are you know, it's really good for that reason. But Quantum Redshift is a game that took the cake for me. Quantum Redshift is the reason why 
is the reason why I bought an original Xbox and the reason why I and well, it's not the real reason why I mean, but it is one of the reasons why, and it's the reason why I kept playing it so many times. So when the first Xbox that I bought, it eventually died due to ruptured, due to ruptured capacitors. I, did, I went out and bought another Xbox for an affordable price, simply because I wanted to play more Quantum Redshift, and there aren't any known Xbox emulators out there. Yeah, so was that with the, so the original Xbox was, like I said, it's, a, it's the one system that I, I mean, I bought it thinking that I could get, you know, so many great I mean, I mean, I still think it was perfectly justified that I got an original Xbox. I still had a lot of fun with it overall. It was a really cool system. Now I've been watching videos on how people get, on how people get, um, um, like, emulators on the original Xbox. Someone actually made, like, Super Mario 64 for the original Xbox. And some people made, had, like, PS1 emulators and N64 emulators that run smoothly on the original Xbox. I'm actually interested in trying out some of that stuff, but it might involve taking apart my Xbox, which is something I'm, I don't know, I don't really trust my, my technological skills, the technology skills of taking stuff apart. I'm afraid, I mean, it's like a surgeon kind of thing. I'm afraid if I take something apart, I might end up breaking it or destroying it by accident. Or, so they, they said you could take it apart to remove those pesky capacitors that are probably going to get ruptured and further destroy my Xbox, causing it to cause more certain doom, but... If I, but, I mean, if I do succeed at this, I could definitely play more Wipeout Free Special Edition on my original Xbox. But I could use some more Raspberry Pi, so what did it matter? I was like, why do I even need another emulation machine? The Raspberry Pi could do a lot of that same stuff. Raspberry Pi is the greatest emulation machine ever, at least my experience is it is. And, the, and, and I don't think the only problem is I don't really have a capture card for it either. I'm thinking about getting a capture card so I can record stuff from the Raspberry Pi. I don't have to use my Windows PC all the time to record stuff with. I have to keep using my Windows PC for capturing stuff. So, so Phantom Mode is actually a lot harder in this game with Asa Guy, and it's actually just much harder on these classic tracks. Because I think the people made these that designed these original tracks, they actually knew, like, you know, like they actually knew how to make them very challenging and very, you know, like, you know, like, like challenging. But I actually find this to be a lot more challenging than Wipeout than and the Wipeout League tracks, I pretty much got, I, don't, I think it's hard to believe that I got through every track in, in Wipeout League without, without losing once, but now when I come to this, these tracks and I get killed a lot, most of the time I lose, it's usually for me getting killed a lot of the time, but that might also be too, because I'm flying as ass a guy, which as I said before, is pathetically weak, look at the cockpit, it's just hanging out on the side of the ship like that, it looks like something could easily come undone and cause certain death to the people flying the ship. Apparently Daniel Chang from the original White, but he's a guy that flew one of the AG systems, the blue AG systems ship in the original White, but apparently he died in some sort of crash. But we never know, because that's never addressed in any of the games. Heck, White, but the Wipeout series doesn't even have any real characters or real people or real anything, really. I mean, the original Wipeout did, and, and they brought that back in Wipeout Fusion for some reason. Because I think because the people made Wipeout Fusion just studied the original Wipeout and only the original Wipeout, and they had no knowledge of Wipeout Excel and Wipeout Free. That's the only reason I could think of. I thought that they brought back different characters. Even then, they don't really do much in the story, and there aren't really any known characters in Wipeout Excel and Wipeout Free. So they probably figured, ah, what's the point of putting characters? They don't play these games as a story. This game doesn't even really have much of a story at all. The video games never needed a story. I guess the people that made Jumping Flash Free knew that way too well. I remember I just recently did a Let's Play of Jumping Flash Free, but I mostly had spent the entire Let's Play addressing how the game lacks its story. The people who made that game clearly didn't care about stories or care about lore or stuff like that, which seems like a lost opportunity considering what the series was before. But Wipeout never really had a lot of lore or a lot of stories. Well, apparently it does, but I'm never going to find any of them. I'm never going to really know about any of them or or anything like that, because it's, you know, it's never addressed in the games themselves. It'll probably just be in the instruction book. But since why do people ever read instruction books? Heck, a lot of games don't even come with instruction books anymore these days. I thought it was odd back, like, over, like a decade ago when I would buy new games on the PS3, and then I would open them up and find there's no instructions in me, and I would think, what? They forgot to put an instruction book in here. And then I realized, oh, wait, that's just how it is. They don't put instruction books in games anymore. That's why you go online now and find everything. I don't think I'm playing, that actually is a pretty, you know, I guess that makes sense. It saves them having to print stuff. It saves them having to make instruction books. But even then, a lot of classic games I buy for some reason don't have instruction books. I remember when I bought Spire Free Year of the Dragon. I thought it had one at first. I thought I had a cover, but I realized it was a low resolution, low quality printed cover of Spyro Free Year of the Dragon. It wasn't the actual instruction book. 
And then I said, well, if the game was, if the game was like $15, this was like 11 years ago, and I said, well, if it was, if it was, I was if, it, if, if it was $30, and, and it was not, and it was just a disc only, it can be even in less condition than what it was now, I still would have bought it, but I didn't want to say that out loud, I didn't want the guy, the greedy guy that runs that store to get any ideas that I'm willing to pay more for stuff. <laughs> I, I remember I used to go to that store, up that game store in my town a lot, thinking I had the best deals around, but games are freaking expensive. I actually found way better prices, way cheaper prices on eBay. I remember 10 years ago, I found Bust and Move 4 for the Dreamcast on, on eBay for like less than half price of what he was selling it for, and it was complete and in very good condition. I still have that copy of Bust and Move 4 to this very day. I don't know if my Dreamcast still works, and I don't remember my Dreamcast had a lot of issues. I actually did take apart my Dreamcast once and I had to tighten a bolt in it or tighten a screw on the lens to, to just slightly, like with hair fin sort of accuracy, trying to get the laser to become slightly more powerful so I could read, like, so I could read games or read games better. But it really worked at first, but again, I don't use my Dreamcast that much anymore, so I wouldn't really know. I can imagine, I mean, imagine that they were to use, like, remember Dreamcast had an emulator for it called Bleem, where it could play PS1 games on the Dreamcast, and they managed to do it with free games, Tekken 3, Metal Gear Solid, and Gran Turismo 2. I think they had plans for more games. I imagine if they were to take this and put it on the Dreamcast, it wouldn't look much different. The game already is pretty well smoothed and pretty well refined, as it already is. People in, the, in 1999, 2000 that looked at this game would have said, it's like, oh, I can't imagine graphics looking any better than this. Yeah, I remember one guy ranted about PS4 back in 2013, and he said, yeah, I can't imagine graphics on the PS3 looking any better. But they did get better, and now the only way it could possibly get any more better is if we start using virtual reality to a point where everything is lifelike, and there's no line between fantasy or reality anymore. I wonder why people get confused as to what's real or what's not. I was just watching a video about that on YouTube where people get confused as to what's real or what's not, or people watch TV shows and they think they're real. I mean, the show has fooled me the most amount of times about being real or fake was Saturday Night Live. I've been fooled by Saturday Night Live on countless occasions as to, oh, is this real or is this fake? <laughs> Did Stevie Wonder really do a camera commercial? Did what did Kevin Spacey really audition to play Han Solo in Star Wars? <laughs> they fall for that stuff all the time. And yet people fell for War of the Worlds, and people fell for so much other stuff. <laughs> and this is level I find is really nostalgic. I have fond memories of playing the original Wipeout at my grandma's house on Friday evenings and Saturday mornings, and I would be in this level in the original Wipeout. It looks exactly the same in this as it did in the original Wipeout of all the same ads and all the same everything. I remember we were playing that song called Message, my favorite, which is my favorite song from the original Wipeout. I'd be in this level. I would just be, and I, and I sucked at the game when I first got it. So I just did time trial and tried to memorize all the tracks. It really paid off because I eventually became a master at that game. I remember this is a level I would play a lot. It's really nostalgic. I imagine this is somewhere in Utah or somewhere like that. And the, the detail, the detailing on the back in the original game was like really spectacular. How they put so much detail into that. And that was back in 1995, and they were able to put so much extreme, like highly detailed, high definition detail into into games. I actually was really impressed. I still consider the original Wipeout to be a masterpiece in that sense, even though the sequels are clearly better. I often think the original Wipeout might be my second least favorite Wipeout game. This one's probably my most favorite. It's either this or Wipeout Excel that's my most favorite one. I mean, Wipeout Excel is definitely my favorite unique Wipeout game. And this one is even up for debate if Wipeout 3 Special Edition really is a separate Wipeout game from regular Wipeout 3. Maybe those people, maybe it's for those odd people watching this video in the comments, maybe you could tell me your opinion on this. Is Wipeout 3 Special Edition a separate Wipeout game? If it is, and there's technically four Wipeout games on the PS1, but if not, if some people are saying, ah, this is the same thing as regular Wipeout 3, but with more content, like a re-release of more content, then I don't think it counts as a separate game. It's up for debate, really, if this counts as another game. But if that's true, that means the Wipeout series could technically count towards Game video game franchises or video game series that have four or more installments on the system they debuted. A lot of them will be on the PS1. Battle Arena Tashinden will be another series like that. Battle Arena Tashinden, the demo for the first one, was on the same demo disc as the Wipeout demo. And there were four of those games on the original PS1. I think the fourth one on was, wasn't even called Battle Arena Toshinden 4. It was just called Toshinden 4. They were that lazy, so they dropped the Battle Arena part from the title. And there aren't really any characters. It's kind of like going Twisted Metal 4. There aren't really any contestants from the first three games. In Twisted Metal 4, it's mostly all new contestants, mostly all new things. 
There aren't any Wipeout games that are like that. Yeah, I can imagine them making a Wipeout game with an entirely new cast of ships or entirely new... I mean, there is a Wipeout game. I don't know. I haven't really played... I, or as far as of now, Wipeout Pulse is still the most recent Wipeout game I've ever played. I am aware that there's, there are more Wipeout games made since Wipeout Pulse, but I never actually played any of them since then. So maybe there are some Wipeout games out there that consist entirely of, you know, new ships and new stuff. I remember Wipeout was a subject for a, for, I remember I had to do some, like, well, I still have studying of Wipeout, because it was a subject of a project I did in web development, where I tried making a database of all the different Wipeout scores and Wipeout times that people can get at, at, at the different Wipeout games, like a database system of that, so you can figure out who the greatest Wipeout player in the world is. I have no idea who the greatest Wipeout player in the world is, but it's probably not me. There's other people, there's other, like, people that, you know, sit in their basements all day long and just play nothing with the Wipeout game, so those people are probably, probably going to be better. I mean, there was one guy that supposedly got really good scores at the Zone mode and in the later Wipeout game. Zone was something that Wipeout Fusion introduced, which was, which is pretty much in all the other Wipeout games. It's like a survival game. You have to play through a track and you have to keep surviving what comes up. And it, and it gets faster over time, so you very well can make like a good arcade-style game. A good old dark style survival game. Mm, that sounds pretty good. I actually think that would make an interesting game like that. But yeah, I actually do play that game by time. Like, you know, actually it's something that could work as a standalone game, like a standalone survival game. It's a pretty cool feature, actually. So there, I've cleared every stage in this game. Every, I'm in, in Classic League on Phantom Difficulty. This is Ray Phoenix signing out.